Hello to chapter 104 of Moby Dick by Herman Melville, and this chapter is titled The Fossil Whale. From his mighty bulk, the whale affords a most congenial theme whereon to enlarge, amplify, and generally expatiate. Would you? You could not compress him. By good rights he should only be treated of in imperial folio. Not to tell over again his furlongs from spiracle to tail and the yards he measures about the waist, only think of the gigantic involutions of his intestines where they lie in him like great cables and hawsers coiled away in the subterranean orlop deck of a line of battleship. Since I have undertaken to manhandle this leviathan, it behooves me to approve myself omnisciently exhaustive in the enterprise, not overlooking the minutest seminal germs of his blood and spinning him out to the uttermost coil of his bowels. Having already described him in most of his present habitatory and anatomical peculiarities, it now remains to magnify him in an archaeological, fossiliferous and antediluvian point of view. Applied to any other creature than the leviathan, to an ant or a flea, such portly terms might justly be deemed unwarrantably grandiloquent. But when Leviathan is the text, the case is altered. Fain am I to stagger to this enterprise under the weightiest words of the dictionary. And here be it said that whenever it has been convenient to consult one in the course of these dissertations, I have invariably used a huge quarto edition of Johnson expressly purchased for that purpose, because that famous lexicographer's uncommon personal bulk more fitted him to compile a lexicon to be used by a whale author like me. One often hears of writers that rise and swell with their subject, though it may seem but an ordinary one. How then, with me, writing of this leviathan, unconsciously my Chirography expands into placard capitals. Give me a condor's quill. Give me Vesuvius' crater for an inkstand. Friends, hold my arms, for in the mere act of penning my thoughts of this leviathan, they weary me and make me faint with their outreaching comprehensiveness of sweep as if to include the whole circle of the sciences and all the generations of whales and men and mastodons, past, present and to come, with all the revolving panoramas of empire on earth and throughout the whole universe, not excluding its suburbs. Such and so magnifying is the virtue of a large and liberal theme. We expand to its bulk. To produce a mighty book, you must choose a mighty theme. No great and enduring volume can ever be written on the flea, though many there be who have tried it. Ere entering upon the subject of fossil whales, I present my credentials as a geologist by stating that in my miscellaneous time I have been a stonemason and also a great digger of ditches, canals and wells, wine vault cellars and cisterns of all sorts. Likewise, by way of preliminary, I desire to remind the reader that while in the earlier geological strata there are found the fossils of monsters, now almost completely extinct, the subsequent relics discovered in what are called the tertiary formations seem the connecting or at any rate intercepted links between the antichronical creatures and those whose remote posterity are said to have entered the Ark, all the fossil whales hitherto discovered belong to the tertiary pe period, which is the last preceding the superficial formations. 
and though none of them precisely answer to any known species of the present time, they are yet sufficiently akin to them in general respects to justify their taking ranks as Cetacean fossils. Detached broken fossils of pre-Adamite whales, fragments of their bones and skeletons have within 30 years past at various intervals been found at the base of the Alps in Lombardy and France, in England and Scotland and in the states of Louisiana, Mississippi and Alabama. Among the more curious of such remains is part of a skull, which in the year 1779 was disinterred in the Rue Dauphine in Paris, a short street opening almost directly upon the palace of the Tuyers, and bones disinterred in excavating the great docks of Antwerp in Napoleon's time. Cuvier pronounced these fragments to have belonged to some utterly unknown leviathanic species. But by far the most wonderful of all the Cetacean relics was the almost complete vast skeleton of an extinct monster found in the year 1842 on the plantation of Judge Creek in Alabama. The awe-stricken, credulous slaves in the vicinity took it for the bones of one of the fallen angels. The Alabama doctors declared it a huge reptile and bestowed upon it the name of Basilosaurus. But some specimen bones of it being taken across the sea to Owen, the English anatomist, it turned out that this alleged reptile was a whale, though of a departed species. A significant illustration of the fact, again and again repeated in this book, that the skeleton of the whale furnishes but little clue to the shape of his fully invested body. So Owen rechristened the monster Zeuglodon, and in his paper read before the London Geological Society, pronounced it, in substance, one of the most extraordinary creatures which the mutations of the globe have blotted out of existence. When I stand among these mighty leviathan skeletons, skulls, tusks, jaws, ribs and vertebrae, all characterized by partial resemblances to the existing breeds of sea monsters, but at the same time bearing on the other hand similar affinities to the annihilated anti-chronical leviathans, their incalculable seniors, I am by a flood born back to that wondrous period, ere time itself can be said to have begun, for time began with man. Here Saturn's grey chaos rolls over me, and I obtain dim, shuddering glimpses into those polar eternities when wedged bastions of ice pressed hard upon what are now the tropics. And in all the 25,000 miles of this world's circumference, not an inhabitable hand's breadth of land was visible. Then the whole world was the whales, and king of creation, the left, his wake, he left his wake along the present lines of the Andes and the Himalayas. Who can show a pedigree like Leviathan? Ahab's harpoon had shed older blood. Ahab's harpoon had shed older blood than the pharaohs. Methuselah seems a schoolboy. I look round to shake hands with Shem. I am horror struck at this anti-mosaic, unsourced existence of the unspeakable terrors of the whale, which, having been before all time, must needs exist after all humane ages are over. But not alone has this leviathan left his pre-Adamite traces in the stereotype plates of nature and in limestone and marl bequeathed his ancient bust but upon Egyptian tablets whose antiquity seems to claim for them an almost fo fossiliferous character, we find the unmistakable print of his fin in an apartment of the great temple of Dendera. Some fifty years ago there was discovered upon the granite ceiling a sculptured uh, 
and painted planisphere abounding in centaurs, griffins, and dolphins similar to the grotesque figures on the celestial globe of the moderns. Gliding among them, old leviathans swam as of yore, was there swimming in the planisphere centuries before Solomon was cradled. Nor must there be omitted another strange attestation of the antiquity of the whale in his own osseous post-diluvian reality as set down by the venerable John Leo, the old Barbary traveller. Not far from the seaside they have a temple, the rafters and beams of which are made of whale bones, for whales of a monstrous size are oftentimes cast up dead upon that shore. The common people imagine that by a secret power bestowed by God upon the temple, no whale can pass it without immediate death. But the truth of the matter is that on either side of the temple there are rocks that shoot two miles into the sea and wound the whales when they light upon them. They keep a whale's rib of an incredible length for a miracle which, lying upon the ground with its convex part uppermost, makes an arch, the head of which cannot be reached by a man upon a camel's back. This rib says John Leo, is said to have lain there a hundred years before I saw it. Their historians affirm that a prophet who prophesied of Mahomet came from his temple, and some do not stand to assert that the prophet Jonas was cast forth by the whale at the base of the temple. In this Afric temple of the whale, I leave you, reader, and if you be an Nantucketer and a whaleman, you will silently worship there. So that was chapter 104. Bye bye till next time with chapter 105 titled Does the Whale's Magnitude Diminish? Will He Perish? And in case you're watching slash listening this on the day that I had or, or have recorded it, I wish you a very Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays. <laughs>